It's very ironic to hear a man described as dangerous because he has announced that he's going to follow the instructions uh, from Congress. Judge Bork has said he prefers the original non-discrimination concept of affirmative action. This means that he would permit the, uh, and would actively permit uh, active recruitment of, uh, recruitment of qualified minorities, among other things. The alternative, as you know, is some form of mandatory pro proportional representation for minorities, or quotas, to put it in one word. Now, you, do you believe that mandatory proportional representation benefits minorities? No. In fact, I think one of the great handicaps that uh, blacks and other minorities face across the country is that they are systematically mismatched with universities in the admissions process. That is, if, if Harvard feels that it must have X percent of blacks, and if the pool is such that they can't get X percent of blacks at the same level as the rest of the Harvard students, they're going to take those blacks who would have succeeded in some state university and bring them to Harvard where many of them will fail. Or MIT is a better example, that the average black student at MIT is in the bottom 10 percent of M MIT students in math. But he is in the top 90% of all American students in math because MIT students are so phenomenal in mathematics. Something like one-fourth of all the black students going to MIT do not graduate. You're talking about a pool of people who score at the 90th percentile in math whom you are artificially turning into failures by mismatching them with the school. Back in the, much earlier, you had a great increase of blacks in the universities through the GI Bill. You had nothing like that kind of attrition from that process because the, the student went wherever he could be accepted, wherever he met the normal standards, and the government simply paid the money. Um, let me ask you a couple questions. Uh, uh, you think judicial activism, uh, doctor, has hurt blacks. Uh, judicial activism of uh, eliminating restrictive covenants in deeds, uh, um, eliminating segregation in schools, uh, one man, one vote, literacy test. Do you consider those judicially active? Well, as regards restrictive covenants, uh, I can see no evidence that they did anything other than make some people feel good because it was symbolic. Uh, as regards desegregation of the school system, that should have been done long before and on a much more sound basis. I've, I've gone into this at great length in, in previous writings. Uh, but are the they? Problem with, no, no. You see, the problem is not whether you believe that school desegregation should have ended. I, I believe it should have ended long before. Okay. George Bork believes it should have ended long before. What he and what I have objected to are the principles used in that decision, because those principles take on a life of their own, and they come back to haunt you in other areas. Obviously, this, this old phrase, the hard cases make bad law, uh, derived from that fact. You dream up a principle to reach this result, and then the principle has a life of its own. So the principle of desegregating the No, schools. that wasn't the principle. The principle was the reason that they picked for it. Was well, that that's was, all I'm saying. Hmm. Okay, the reasons they picked yes. of desegregating the schools, you and Judge Bork agree, were the wrong principles, and they should have not. So the, sh the court shouldn't have done that. The, no, no, the, the court should have done it. Oh, okay. Both of us have said the court should have done it. I see. And in my case, and I think in his case, the court should have done it a lot sooner. How? They should, have, they should have ruled that it wasn't equal protection of the law, because nobody in his right mind believes that there was equal protection of the law in the Jim Crow era uh, of, the, of these okay. school systems. I'm just trying to figure out yes. what you're saying. Yes. Now, in the, in, when they desegregated the D.C. schools, mm -hmm. it's clear the 14th Amendment does not apply. Everyone agrees that the 14th Amendment does not apply to the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. How would they have done it in the District of Columbia? Should they have just let it stand in the District of Columbia? Segregation? I, no, in fact, Senator, it's interesting that you say that because uh, I've gotten uh, the first thing I ever wrote in my, uh, to, on a public issue was in November 13, 1950, in the Washington Star, in which I argued for the desegregation of the D.C. school system. So that, uh, on what principle? I, I, I had not studied nearly as much then as I have 37 years later. Uh, and, and so I, I hadn't worked it out, nor, nor do I think that I would want to work it out on the run in, in front of a large group of, of lawyers uh, at this very moment in the time that's available. Well, I, how about literacy test? Was it judicial? I, oh, I, I, I see no, pro no reason why people shouldn't be literate in order to vote. The question is, if you have a black who comes in with his degree from Harvard and the uh, man behind the desk says, no, you're not literate, you can't vote, then this, this, you see, this is what bothers me. People are talking about how 
judges should be sensitive to this particular group or yeah. that particular group. And if that means anything, if it means he's applying the law differently, that's precisely how blacks were held down for generations in the South. I see. So by literacy applying the law differently. So literacy tests, as long as they were equally applied, yeah. are, are all right. Sure. So I thought you thought. Um, now, uh, I also want to clarify, you, I, I, I gather from your comments about MIT and Harvard that you don't think there's enough blacks out there who are qualified to fill the number of vacancies allotted for them in those schools. Is that right? Is that what you're well, saying? Well, the word, word qualifies really is misleading. Well, the question is whether or not they, may, they are like the other students at Harvard and MIT. Well, okay. Oh, so there's not. So, so they, they may be perfectly qualified. The same student might go to, through, God help us, I hope there's no idea from Illinois, uh, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology and do well. Okay. But, but there's no reason why he should fail at MIT. There's, there's no prestige in flunking out of the Ivy League. I got it. So, but my point is, you believe there are not enough black women and men out there that are the same as white women and men to be able to go through Harvard and MIT. Yeah. If there were, it would mean that the whole history of oppression had done no harm, whatever. Well, so the answer is you don't think there are. I'm not, I just want to no, figure no, out what no, you're no, saying. It's not a question of what I think. It's a factual matter. So factually, uh, the, you're oh, saying factually there are not enough. Factually, this study's already been done by ClickGuard at Harvard, and he, the, the figures are all there. Anyone can look yeah. them up. Okay, no, I, 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 I just want to hear from you. Mm -hmm. I, I want sure. to know what you're thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. um, have you read uh, all of Judge Bork's cases or no. any of them? Have I'm, you read all of his writings? I haven't read all of them, but I, I've been reading them for more than 20 years because I, was in, I used to teach antitrust economics. Sure. Now, are you part of what they call the, the law and economic school? You know, that, <laughs> would you consider know. yourself part I, of that school? I, I, I nothing wrong with that. It's not I, a bad school. I just want to know where you are. Uh, I, I, when I sit down to write, Senator, I, I don't ask what my label is. I don't, I don't, I don't check my uh, identification tag to see what I, what I am. But well, I, I did, um, uh, one of my books did win a prize as the best book in law and economics in 1980. Yeah, no, but I mean, there is a, a, there's almost a term of art out there called the School of Law and Economics. Yes. And are, 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 are you part of that school intellectually? That's all I'm trying to get. I'm very much interested in the application of economic principles in the law and vice versa. Right. Now, my time's up. You are with the Hoover Institute as a fellow. What is your academic background? Are you a lawyer? I, mean, I should know. But oh, I'm, a, I'm an economist by trade, but I've wandered into other fields. Uh, you, do you have an educational degrees in law as well? No, no, in economics. Just in, 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 economics. In, in, in economics, all right. Uh, you uh, mentioned the school systems and uh, indicated you didn't think that the decisions of the courts, which uh, brought about uh, uh, desegregation, are you saying it, and as I understood you, that you use the phrase judicial activism, hadn't helped minorities? Uh, oh, oh, no, Senator. I, I, I've maybe been I misunderstood those. you. Maybe. Oh, no, no. What I said was that I thought that the desegregation not only should have taken place, should have taken place a lot earlier. But, it, but a different set of reasoning should have been used. Well, how, how do you, as I understood it, you were say, saying that the court action hasn't helped minorities. Oh, I haven't said, I'm saying that at all. That's the problem with pat phrases like judicial activism, because everybody means something different by it. Uh, well, what, how, what do you mean? I, I just was in curious about how you say that the school children who are blacks, uh, in a desegregated school haven't been helped. I, that's is what I understood you to say. No, no, I'm saying that by using the kind of reasoning they did, drawing upon principles not in any written document anywhere, uh, any legal document anywhere, but on, for example, the uh, famous doll tests of, uh, of uh, Kenneth Clark and so on, uh, if you buy the line of reasoning they, get, they give, then you have a definition of segregation for schools, which is totally different from the definition of segregation in any other institution in our society. That is, by the definitions that are used in schools to start busing, Dulles Airport is segregated. This room may be segregated, for all I know, by, by those percentage decision, uh, representation things. Well, I, I didn't understand, I, just to clarify my own mind as to your testimony, 
I, I didn't exactly understand what you had what you had in mind when you said something about the restrictive covenants. I assume what the, I don't remember the exact words, but in effect that the decisions that eliminated restrictive covenants haven't benefited. Well, I know of no one who has even claimed that there's been any discernible difference in the housing pattern brought about by either Shelley V. Kramer or Reitman V. Malky. In other words, you say that there's been no change. I'm saying of that era. Now, over a long 30-year period with lots of economic changes, then you may have some gradual changes. But even so, it's been uh, fairly uh, minuscule. All right. I believe it. Tell me about it. got 30 seconds, so... Uh... Uh, and there's no point in asking another question. Dr. Sowell, you grew up in Harlem? Yes. Safe to assume you were not born with a silver spoon in your mouth? I think that's very safe, Senator. From which universities do you hold degrees? Uh, Harvard, Columbia, the University of Chicago. Harvard, Columbia, and the University of Chicago. That's right. You are a nationally syndicated columnist? Uh, yes. At one time, uh, you were... Uh, you were pretty far over on the left of the political spectrum, were you not? Uh, yes, yes, I was. I was a Marxist. You were a Marxist. So, so I have great sympathy with people who changed their views over the years. I was coming to that. <laughs> you would say your views have matured as you have matured in age? Yes. No. You are uh, a man of brilliant mind, obviously. Supposing you were now being considered, supposing you were sitting there right now as a nominee to a high federal position, and you've been offered high federal positions, mm. which you've turned down, but supposing you were sitting there as a nominee uh, in the confirmation process, would it be fair for senators to repeatedly refer to your statements as a Marxist, as the principal basis for, uh, for granting or denying confirmation? I would think not, Senator. How do you feel about black Americans who have come before this committee and have opposed uh, uh, confirmation? Do you think they, they serve the black community well? No, I don't. Uh, I don't know what all their reasons are. Uh, one of the sad things that happens with any organization over a period of time is that as it fulfills its mission, it looks for new missions because organizations don't die quietly. And I think there are many, many problems that need to be addressed in the black community. Not all of them can be addressed with either the rhetoric or the strategies of the 1950s. But people tend to, re generals fight the last war over and over again. And I think that's what's happening here.